Hi there, everyone. Uh, welcome to this week's C4C webinar. I uh, hope you've been enjoying the series so far. My name, for those who don't know me, is Nikki Ison. I uh, have two hats in, uh, in this space. Uh, so I'm currently working as Secretariat for the Coalition for Community Energy, but also uh, one of the founding directors of the Community Power Agency. And, Community Power Agency has some funding at the moment to, to do some intro to the energy system trainings. And so this is a second of four webinars about intro to the energy system. Uh, we're going to be talking today uh, about energy policy. Uh, last week, we um, I did an overview of the national electricity market. Next week, I think uh, we're going to be talking about energy technologies. And the week after, we're going to be talking about renewable energy. Um, before I go any further and get started on the slides, uh, I would like to invite you to w ask questions as we go along. So you can either do that through the Q&A function or ideally through the chat function. Uh, so if you're out there, uh, please do ask questions as we go along. Policy, energy policy can be a little bit complicated. Um, before I go any further, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, I am currently uh, on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation in Sydney, um, and I'd like to pay their, my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I think uh, in the energy space and the climate space, we can learn a lot from the tra traditional owners of this land. And in part, I will touch on some policy that can support Aboriginal communities around the country to repower with clean energy. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen, um, but I'll still be here. Uh, give me a second. Uh, so, uh, energy policies. Uh, what I'm going to do in this webinar session, I'm going to talk uh, for about 30 or 40 minutes. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, two things. One is I'm going to go through the top four or five energy policies that I think are, have played a really fundamental role in our energy system or could play a really fundamental role in uh, transforming our energy system going forward. And then I'm going to give an overview of the full policy suite um, as we've outlined um, in a document called the Homegrown Power Plan. I just realised uh, that because uh, I'm flying solo tonight, I can't always see people chat. So every now and again, I will stop uh, sharing my screen and just check in back on the chat function. So let me just test that process first. Ah, that's how we find it. Try one more time. Yes, there we go. I can see people's, um, yes, so use the Q&A um, function, please, if um, rather than the chat function. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, so how do key policies work? Um, nice cartoon fairly accurately represents the state of energy politics at the moment. But let's start with the renewable energy target. The renewable energy target has been responsible in Australia for driving the vast majority of new renewables uh, since about 2001. Um, so just a little bit of history before I go into how it works. So in Australia, back in the Howard era, uh, back in 99, 2000, when John Howard's government did a deal with the Democrats to pass the GST. One of the uh, requirements that the Democrats um, made as part of that deal was to establish the Mandatory Renewable Energy Target, or MRET. That was set at about 2.5% of Australia's electricity from renewables by 2010 and came into a full in effect in about 2001. And uh, it was so successful that it um, saw um, all of the electricity um, under that policy being deployed. So all the renewables technologies, particularly uh, large scale wind, uh, deployed by about 2006, 2007. 
So, uh, and then after that, uh, a few years of negotiations, but the Rudd government in 2009 passed and expanded renewable energy target, uh, 20% by 2020. Uh, and then it's gone through a few iterations since then. Uh, under the Abbott government, uh, the RET got wound back from what it was uh, predicted to be 20%, 41,000 gigawatt hours, down to 33,000 gigawatt hours. So um, we had a reduction, but it still represents you know, about 20% of our electricity or more by 2020, but it's nowhere near as much as we could have had without the Abbott government. So how does it work? I suppose before, I, actually, before I go into that, I will say that the renewable energy target is based on a, a model or a policy that's used widely around the world. In the UK, they, they have their renewable energy portfolio standards um, and in a number of states in the US as well. So this is a policy mechanism that's used uh, internationally and we've got our own version of it here in Australia. So how it works, the first step is that you set a mandated target for how much renewable electricity or gigawatt hours is needed by uh, a date, in this case uh, 2020. Then what you do is you set annual targets. So how much, what's the pathway from where we are now? So that say in 2009 when Rudd was setting the, the target through to 2020. Um, interestingly, they backloaded the targets. They made the earlier years, they didn't just sort of divide the increase um, by the number of years, 11 years. They um, backloaded it and said more will come online after 2015. Um, the reason they did that was because uh, the geothermal industry said that we can really crack this geothermal nut by 2015, you should you know, give us incentive to keep going. Unfortunately, the geothermal industry uh, did not crack. They're not. Uh, they cracked their drill bits, and so um, what we have uh, is you know, less renewable energy that went in in that sort of 2009 to 2015 era. Um, so you set annual targets, and then what you do is require retailers to purchase their fair share of that target or their proportion of that target. Uh, so AGL, Origin, PowerShop. All of the, these retailers have to purchase um, a certain amount of renewable electricity each year. And to make that process easier and transparent, um, instead of saying, oh, it's just all about we're going to look at your whole portfolio of contracts um, and you know, determine whether you've purchased exactly the amount of renewables. What the legislation does, the renewable energy target legislation does, is create a new market and a new currency. Uh, that currency or, or um, commodity, not currency, commodity, um, is a large scale generation certificate or LGC, where one certificate is equal to one megawatt hour of renewable electricity. So the certificate represents the renewableness of a megawatt hour of, of uh, electricity. Um, so that means when uh, I build a wind farm, if I were to build a wind farm, I would sell my electricity, my electrons, uh, to, through the wholesale market or directly to a retailer, but I would also sell, generate and sell LGCs. These LGCs are then traded through, through the, the LGC certificate markets and market, and this market has been established and set up um, to go until 2030. So while we have a proportion of renewables set for 2020, the trading mechanism that underpins it in these certificates goes out to 2030. Then, because, you know, when you've got a policy, you typically need to have uh, a penalty if someone doesn't comply with the policy. What the penalty mechanisms in the renewable energy target is um, each year, each retailer has to report to the um, clean energy regulator about whether it's improved that they've um, bought enough renewable energy certificates, large generation certificates. If they don't, 
purchase enough of these certificates, they will then have to pay a penalty to the government of $80 per certificate that they're short. So say they only purchase 80% uh, of the certificates they need to. For the remaining 20%, they'll have to pay $80 a megawatt hour or $80 a certificate. This effectively creates a, a ceiling on the market price for certificates. If certificate prices are starting to go much above $80 a megawatt hour or $80 a certificate, for retailers, they may as well just pay the penalty price. So the thing about the renewable energy target and these sort of certificate trading schemes is it sets the amount of electricity from renewable sources that um, a uh, government wants to see, but it doesn't set a price. It, that makes it it's a, a least cost policy mechanism. And so in the early days, this deployed a lot of uh, large scale wind because that was the most uh, cost effective uh, renewable energy technology. These days it's driving a lot of large scale wind and large scale solar because they're both pretty competitive at the moment. Uh, but there was a question about what about households? What about rooftop solar? Um, when Rudd first got elected, they had their uh, $8,000 means tested rebate for people wanting to install solar. Um, but that was getting pretty expensive. And so they looked at how could they support uh, household solar through the renewable energy target mechanism. And what they did was they split the renewable energy target in two. There was the large generation and then small generation. And so solar projects, uh, 99 kilowatts or less, are eligible for small technology certificates and uh, renewables, anything above 100 kilowatts, uh, gets uh, local ge uh, large generate uh, LGCs. And so what that means is that there was uh, now a market for STCs and then a market for LGCs. The thing about um, you know STCs and, and rooftop solar is you and I as householders don't have the ability to trade in our certificates. Um, the thing that we want is to make it cheaper when we first buy our uh, solar panels. So what they did was they said, okay, for each location around the country, we're going to estimate how much electricity a solar panel will generate in a year. Um, then we'll times it by either 15 um, years or however long out to 2030. So at the moment it's 13 years. Uh, and then we're going to work out how many STCs that represents, um, give them a value, and you'll get that as an upfront capital reduction. And so solar installers manage that all that process for you, and it's now just cheaper for you to purchase solar. But that seats that subsidy. That's not a subsidy. That um. Uh, that program sits um, as part of the renewable energy target legislation. Um, it had some unintended consequences in the early days, but um, it's working quite well at the moment. Before I move on to the next uh, policy, do anyone have any questions about how the renewable energy target works? Okay, I'm going to keep going. So the next policy is the fair price for solar or a feed-in tariff. I think the first thing to say about feed-in tariffs is that there have been two types of feed-in tariffs. Um, premium feed-in tariffs or feed-in tariffs 1.0 and then what we have now which is more about a fair price for services rendered or fair price for solar. So feed-in tariffs 1.0 um, were, were the most pol popular policy mechanism to drive renewables around the world. In Australia, they just applied to rooftop solar um, of different sizes depending on what state you were in. But around the world, places like Germany, they applied to all technology, renewable technologies at all different scales. The purpose of the feed-in tariff is to stimulate, uh, or feed-in tariff 1.0, was to stimulate an industry was to create a market for a new technology 
and set the price that they would get to ensure that it covered all the costs of installing, of making and installing that renewables technology with a, you know, some degree of margin of additional benefit on top of that. So typically in Australia, they were 25 cents a kilowatt hour or more. Um, in, in New South Wales, the solar bonus scheme was 60 cents a kilo, kilowatt hour. Um, it was extremely successful. We have in Australia one of the best rooftop solar industries in the world. So, you know, we did very well with the policy um, mechanism. Um, and really our industry no longer needs that premium feed-in tariff. Because what, what feed-in tariffs also did in creating that industry or that market is help drive down the cost of installing solar. And it's done that globally, but also here in Australia. Now what we need is feed-in tariffs 2.0, which is a fair price for the services rendered. So the services that solar panels provide, um, electricity to the grid, uh, reduced uh, transmission costs, um, a whole bunch of environmental benefits, health benefits, network benefits, and some network costs. The thing is, is that our electricity system is not set up for millions of small generators. It's set up for a handful of really large generators. So it's not uh, every household isn't able to access the full benefit or the, the full benefit monetarily um, from a, a feed-in tariff, which is why we need a policy, we need governments to set what feed-in tariffs are. Uh, the was research conducted by um, a guy called Jack Gilding. He's a key guy from the community energy sector and he got some funding to look at what a fair feed in tariff or a fair price for solar would be. And it was something in the order of 11 to 18 cents, depending on where you are. Um, so that 12 to 16 cents is sort of in that ballpark. So certainly above the wholesale price of electricity, um, but not so much as the full retail price of electricity. And I wanted to, to sort of show and highlight the range of different value propositions that local energy could provide. And there's some, been some great work by the Rocky Mountain Institute in the US that sort of talks about these stacked energy services. And each service in, in terms of, um, you know, it might only be worth like half a cent a kilowatt hour, but it all adds up. And particularly when you start to add batteries in the mix, the amount of reactive power and grid stabilising power that can be provided through that, you know, there's, there's a whole range of these services that local energy can provide, but we don't currently enable the monetize those services, um, which is why we then need to bundle them all up into a feed-in tariff program. And that's essentially what the Victorian government and the Victorian Essential Services Commission has done in recommending a a price, a feed-in tariff price of something like 11 cents a kilowatt hour, I think, um, maybe a little bit more, um, based on not just the wholesale price and uh, you know, the line losses, which is the base level, but also in terms of the environmental benefits. Um, they weren't able to monetize the health benefits, but they did look at it. Um, more research is needed there. But one of the other things that they did is they took the average um, wholesale price during the hours that the sun shines, which is higher. The average wholesale price of electricity is much higher during the day than it is overnight. So it also provided a time waiting. So, you know, that's how we, you know, are moving from these premium uh, feed-in tariffs to fair price for solar feed-in tariffs. The third policy mechanism that I wanted to talk about is clean energy auctions or reverse auctions. So the way uh, these, this mechanism is now the most popular policy mechanism uh, for renewable energy, for governments driving renewables around the world for about the last two years. We went from feed-in tariffs and certificate schemes, now reverse auctions are really, really popular and they're driving some of the lowest costs uh, renewables in the world. There was something. There was something in the news yesterday where Mexico um, did a reverse auction program, and the winning bid was for a large solar project was something like 1.7 cents a kilowatt hour um, for electricity, which is probably about two, two and a bit cents here in Australia, because um, that'd be US cents. But but still, like that's so cheap. Uh, compared to you know, where solar was um, just five years ago. 
Um, and the renewable energy, pro, uh, uh, these reverse auctions have been really um, critical in driving that. So how do they work? Basically a government typically, but it could be uh, a series of local councils or even a large energy user can go out to tender. They go out to tender and say, I want this number of megawatt hours or I want this number of megawatts of renewable energy. I also want to make sure it delivers local energy, local benefits to the community which the, the project is located in. I want to ensure that it drives some uh, you know, benefits to the you know, broader community or state that it's in. Um, and I want to make sure that it's compliant with all of the other planning laws and things like that. So set a series of different criteria. Then uh, renewable energy project developers will put in a tender document which sets out how many megawatts or megawatt hours of electricity they can provide. Um, it will set out how they meet the other criteria and then it will set out what price they can do it for. So it might be um, one of the successful winners of the ACT, one of the first ACT wind auctions um, was the Canoe Bridge Wind Farm and it bid in at 7.7 .7 cents a kilowatt hour. So then everyone puts in these tenders, uh, all of these different project developers, the government or the large energy user assesses them and typically the winning bids are ones that are compliant but then the ones that are cheapest. Uh, and so uh, the Victorian government, for example, has just announced a 650 megawatt uh, clean energy auction program or renewable energy auction program. It's obviously not going to be one 650 megawatt you know, renewables project. It will probably be five or seven or eight different projects. So it'll be you know, a series of winners of these different projects, uh, of the auctions. And what they win, why they're bothering to do that, is something called a contract for difference or CFD. And this is the thing that's really neat. So a contract for difference basically is a guarantee that over the contract term, typically 10 to 15 years, that renewables project will definitely get, in the case of Canoa Bridge, 7.7 .7 cents a kilowatt hour. They're not at the whim of the wholesale price, which sometimes is down in negative and sometimes up at you know, $140 a cents a kilowatt hour, and, but a lot of the time sitting at four cents a kilowatt hour, or typically, you know, eight years ago, that's certainly where we're at. So it doesn't, it gives certainty um, rather than um, the volatility that comes when you're playing just in the wholesale electricity market. And if there's certainty, that means that it's uh, a low risk investment, um, which uh, makes them cheaper because you can get cheaper costs of finance and, um, and people are you know, happy to, to um, you know, a government contract is pretty stable and pretty bankable. So it lowers the cost in general. Um, and it also provides certainty. And the way it does, and it's also a mechanism that is cheap for government. So I've said that government can guarantee a price, but the way they do it is they say, all right, you wind farm, Canoa Bridge, you're going to sell your electricity in the wholesale market. Whenever the strike price is less than 7.7 .7 cents a kilowatt hour, we, the ACT government, will top it up to 7 cents. So say in a 30 minute period, it's 5 cents. That means that the ACT government will top up the amount of electricity generated in that 30 minute period from Canoa Bridge to um, buy an extra 2.7 cents. However, in a 30 minute period, maybe it's up to 10 cents a kilowatt hour. So what happens then is Canoa Bridge actually pays the ACT government back the difference. So they'll pay the ACT government uh, 2.3 cents a kilowatt hour. So it means that it also stops the gaming of the system by you know, projects and helps lower the wholesale price for everyone because there's less gaming of the system going on. So it makes um, low cost bankable projects that also um, put downward pressure on the wholesale price uh, more generally. So it's quite a neat mechanism. 
one of the challenges about the clean energy auction or reverse auction mechanism is it's really only good for large renewable energy project developers. You've got to have enough uh, capital behind you that you can take a risk, you can, you can afford to put uh, together a good tender and you're able to take a risk. So you know, there's a conversation, um, the, one of the recommendations from the Victorian Parliamentary Inquiry for com into Community Energy was that one of the um, uh, tender um, requirements for participating projects in the reverse option program of Victoria should be that they start to partner with local community energy groups. So what we might see and what we're starting to see is more community developer partnerships. So communities are typically not able to um, develop these projects uh, or, or these tenders by themselves, but they may be able to support and be part of a larger renewables project. So Sapphire Wind Farm, for example, in uh, the New England is a winner of the ACT auction and part of their agreement and the contract process with um, the ACT and part of their proposal was that they would investigate having a park community ownership of their wind farm and so people like Taryn Lane are in the process of working out um, whether there's interest and how to um, facilitate that type of process. So it's um, these clean energy options while they're not necessarily appropriate for community energy projects uh, by themselves are helping to drive a new form of community energy in these community developer partnerships. Are there any questions on those? Um, there's the Q&A function, but also the chat. Okay, well, I'll keep going. Hopefully I'm not losing anyone. The final policy that I wanted to talk through um, is the Smart Energy Communities Program. So this is a policy uh, that um, we developed here uh, at the Community Power Agency uh, almost two years ago, um, but in with input from a whole range of community energy actors. Um, we call it, We used to call it the, the Community Powerhouses Program. We now call it the Smart Energy Communities Program. And we think that this program not only is good for community energy, but it's good for driving um, more local energy projects, um, be they from local councils, from small business, to support locked out energy users like renters and apartment dwellers and so on. The policy is um, modelled on land care. Um, I'm sure uh, many of you watching this have heard about or maybe even been involved in land care. Um, for those who haven't been, uh, a little potted history uh, in uh, 1989, pretty sure, uh, Hawke uh, the Prime Minister then announced with uh, bipartisan support the decade of land care. It was a policy proposed by the Farmers Federation and the Australian Conservation Foundation. And it was a program that was about supporting grassroots activity to increase both agricultural productivity and also to better protect our natural environment and restore our natural environment. And so what we have now, 27 years later, is the Landcare program still exists. It's gone through ups and downs, but it still exists. And it consists of 56 natural resource management organisations that are doing great you know, work protecting our environment. Uh, then there are something like 3,000 volunteer land care and coast care groups across the country that are doing local activity. These groups are then supported by a range of national programs and grants. Uh, and then there has been statewide and national land care networks to provide support and capacity and increase um, that, that. So we took that idea, basically went, well, that was what grassroots environmentalism was back in the day. Um, it's still happening, but there's a new wave of grassroots environmentalism and that's around climate change and energy. Um, we see it in the community energy sector, but we see it beyond that. Um, and we need similar types of institutional and funding support. Um, we looked around and we are big fans uh, of the Moreland Energy Foundation. Uh, they are an amazing organisation and really um, they play a role not dissimilar from these natural resource management organisations. They are a community-based organisation tied to a local government that runs 
innovative local energy programs supporting households and community energy groups and business um, to decarbonize, to do energy efficiency, to do solar, to do other renewables. They also provide information, expertise, coordination and support. And we went, well, we really need a lot more of them. So the policy and the program we're, we're proposing is 50 regional energy hubs, where regional energy hubs are organisations like Moreland Energy Foundation located in 50 regions across Australia. And when I say region, that doesn't have to be regional, but like a broad area. We're not suggesting there should be one of these for every single community, but communities of communities. So maybe there's a couple in Sydney, one in Western Sydney, for example, as well as one in the Hunter Valley. Um, then this, uh, these regional energy hubs should be then supported by grants um, for innovative local energy projects that are putting people at the centre of the energy transition and then a national or at least statewide networks to build capacity. So what's happening in the northern rivers of New South Wales can be shared with the folks down in Maroo on the south coast and either and over with the folks in Denmark in Western Australia and so on. Because what we see in the community energy space is huge amounts of passion, volunteer time, effort um, and expertise, but a lot of reinvention of the wheels. So this national network will be aimed at trying to reduce that, but also to start to measure our impact. You know, what is the impact of local energy around the country? So that's the idea from the Smart Energy Communities Program. It's had some success. Uh, in Victoria, the government is trialling three uh, community power hubs, one in the Latrobe Valley, one in Bendigo, one in Ballarat. Uh, the federal ALP and the federal Greens and even the Xenophon team uh, did commit um, to supporting this policy at the last election. Um, and not in power, so we'll see where that goes. Um, but we're working to try and get this up in other states um, around the country. And so if this is something you're particularly interested in, um, please get in contact. Uh, but I wanted to share that sort of, you know, one of the key policies we think is really important. Um, so those are the four key policies that I wanted to talk through because I think it's a good to have a, a solid understanding um, of these um, major policies and then the community energy policy. Um, but I also wanted to take us through uh, today the policy package more broadly. So what's the policy package to get to 100% renewables? This is one of my favourite cartoons of the moment. I hope you enjoy it. So 18 months ago, uh, myself and a woman called Miriam Lyons at GetUp uh, co-authored this document, the Homegrown Power Plan. Uh, there's a summary that you can see and then there's a 134-page policy report. And what is it? It's what an energy white paper would look like if it was written with the long-term interests of people on the planet in mind. It talks not just about how do we ensure that our energy system does not damage the planet, but it also looks at our long-term prosperity and issues of social justice and equality. I'm very proud of this document and really what it is is a policy blueprint for 100% renewable energy. Uh, at the moment, we're in the midst of refreshing this document and updating it, and it's now being supported by seven different organisations and probably a bunch more will sign on as well. Um, I'm going to give you an overview of what it says, 100% renewables, 100% doable, 100% better. And there were three main sections um, of different types of policies that we needed. Um, this is a, a sort of a hodgepodge mix between um, Homegrown Power Plan version 1 and Homegrown Power Plan uh, plan version two, um, but so watch this space on some of them. So the start off is we need to reboot our electricity system and by that means we need to rewrite the rules of the game to make sure that our electricity system works for renewable energy, not for the old paradigm of you know, large polluting fossil fuel power stations. So the first thing we need to do is rewrite the sentence that rules them all, the National Electricity Objective, to ensure that that reflects the need to decarbonise our energy system and make our energy system fair for all. 
Then we need to establish a transition agency. In Germany and Denmark, they both have agencies that are responsible for coordinating the transition to clean energy. That doesn't mean it's all planned centrally from government, but it's about coordinating a range of agencies and private actors. Then we need to fundamentally transform how our networks work because our networks are set up for you know, large power plants sending electrons one way down uh, poles and wires. Um, we need to make it more dynamic and act more like the internet so that we can trade with the people down the road. We also need to fix our retail electricity market because uh, our retailers are gouging us at the moment and it's not good for us and that means it's not good for the electricity transition. We also need to kickstart the transition right now. So the first thing we need to do is recognise that baseload is history. Last week I talked a little bit about that and I'll talk a little bit more about it um, in the 100% renewable session. Um, we need to make sure that network companies don't gold plate again so that they're actually forced to save their customers money through doing non-network solutions and get the incentives right around that. Um, we need to give citizens a real seat at the table in setting how tariffs are made. Currently engineers and economists with very little understanding of what everyday consumers go through are making decisions um, you know, based on theories that really adversely affect um, our everyday lives in the way uh, electricity prices are structured. So we need to you know, shift the way we make decisions around that. And then finally, we need to have a fair price for solar or a fair feed-in tariff, and that was the policy I was talking about earlier. Second section in the homegrown power plan is to repower the country. The first thing we need to do is unleash big renewables. So we need some reverse auctions. Um, and I would say that we need reverse auctions not just for wind and solar, um, but we also need it for the complementary technology. So concentrating solar thermal, sustainable bioenergy, pumped hydro, uh, storage, the technologies that are going to fill in the gaps um, around uh, low cost wind and solar. We then need a long-term pro-renewables price signal. And that's effectively what the renewable energy target has been. There have been other policies proposed, an emissions intensity scheme, most recently the national electricity guarantee. Uh, yeah, all of these are about setting a price signal. Um, some of them work more effectively than others. Um, feel free to ask me questions around the need later on. Um, then we need to give local communities a stake, so making sure that local communities can benefit from large renewables projects and it's not an extracted model of development. We need to walk the talk on innovation. We've already got ARENA, um, our funding body for renewable innovation, um, and Clean Energy Finance Corporation, our green bank, to help commercialise and deploy uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency programs. Um, we need to turbocharge them. Um, and then another idea is the idea of, you know, governments actually taking a lead and powering all their operations uh, with renewables and maybe even starting to develop a fleet of electric vehicles and more. Then we need to power, provide support for people going to renewables. And so I've talked about the Smart Energy Communities Program. We've also got in the Homegrown Power Plan the idea of an Indigenous Clean Energy Program. The key pro purpose there of pro you know, idea there is renewables can help Aboriginal communities um, uh, both, you know, provide power but also a way out of poverty. I'm, that's me paraphrasing um, the words of Aboriginal leaders like Fred Hooper. What we recommend is that governments need to sit down with Aboriginal people and hear what they want and what they need around clean energy. Um, and program support around it, and then design a pro a co design a program accordingly. We've also proposed a, a program called Power Access, um, and it's a publicly owned or public interest retailer for low income households and vulnerable households whose role isn't just to sell electricity cheaply, but also to help households lower their energy bills through energy efficiency. So, becoming a public interest. Um, energy company. Uh, there's some interest in South Australia around this and in Queensland. Um, solar citizens are actively campaigning around it. Then we need um, our housing stock in Australia is like leaky tents. We actually need some better energy performance standards for our housing properties so that all of the solar that we put in 
uh, you know, is cost effective um, when we're powering up, we're also powering down. Finally, we just in quick summary, we need to remove the roadblocks. That means putting in place programs that support communities um, around coal-fired power stations. Um, we need to support old coal-fired power stations out of the system. Um, we need to make our polluters pay for the pollution that they create, and I don't just mean the carbon pollution. Coal-fired power stations are the largest source of a range of different toxic pollutants, including, uh, for example, particulate matter. Um, just transition package is absolutely essential because you know, in the transition to clean energy, some people are going to be more affected than others, and those communities that have traditionally powered our um, nation and economy will be most affected, and we need to support them in that. Um, there's a lot of, I'm, I'm running uh, over these very quickly, but there's a huge amount of detail that sits behind this. Um, we need programs to get out of gas, because gas is not clean energy. Fossil fuel subsidies. They don't make sense and they're a roadblock to our clean energy transition. We need to get rid of them. Uh, grid connection is a challenge, be it for a really big wind farm or for a community energy project or even increasingly for household solar. We need to make grid connection easier. And then the easiest way to get to renewables is to use less electricity and use it more productively. So we need to at least double Australia's energy productivity as we transition to clean energy. So, you know, those are the types of policies or policy areas that we need um, to be addressing, but I, I'm going to leave it there because I've been talking for a long time at 6.40. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments that they would like to make around these policy ideas? Not so much with the comments right now, so uh, um, I uh, maybe might leave it there. Uh, we're running a final intro to the energy system training face-to-face -face in Melbourne next week, Thursday and Friday. Uh, if you go to the Community Power Agency website, cpagency.org.au, you can find a link to the Inventprat page and register if you happen to be in that neck of the woods. Um, uh, we've done one in Brisbane and Sydney and people have found it very useful, which has been great. Um, uh, so thank you for your time and I hope you found that useful and informative and you have a better sense of what renewable energy policy uh, landscape looks like and how some of the key policies work. Um, if you have more detailed questions, you can also send me an email, nikki uh, at cpagency.org.au. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a lovely evening. Cheers.